my, third, my first thought is I want to ask God to bless all of our fathers who are here and those who are missing this morning. Because we're living in an age where really the father is becoming in many areas non-existent. Uh, he is seen as a buffoon or a blunderer. Media, cartoons, they all make fun of him. Many articles in women's magazines and periodicals are now uh, exploiting the idea of the not necessary father. We don't need your father anymore. So we're dealing with issues in which uh, the state of the father is really in question. Uh, there was a, I wish I would have brought it, there was about 30 some different uh, statements on what is happening because of the lack of a father in the family. Some of those included families that have no fathers. I think the suicide rate goes up 35 to 43 percent for children that don't have fathers. High school dropout rate is three or four times what it usually is for others. Drug, alcohol use, uh, pregnancy, uh, lower self-esteem. All of these are issues that happen when a father is not in the home. Uh, and for uh, people who say that a father is not necessary, to take those statistics and say, well, don't you see what's happening when there isn't a father? And they say, we still don't need a father. Uh, I may be out in left field on this, but I believe the theory of the attack on the fathers in our land is actually an attack on God our Heavenly Father. When you attack fathers and you have an affront against the father, you're actually challenging God on his authority in which he has placed the family. <clears throat> With God being evicted from our country and our homes, it's, it, it just falls in, uh, to reason that the father also is being evicted. Uh, when a father feels he's no longer necessary in a home, it's not hard sometimes for them to leave. And uh, there's a lot of pressure that are, 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 are put upon families and fathers. So uh, my thought on that is we really need to be praying for fathers. Uh, and it's not only uh, when I was thinking about it in the home, it's in the church. You know the statistics that there are more adult women than men that attend church. And now there is a great push for women to be elders and deacons and pastors in churches. That, to me, is just another evidence of pushing men out. We don't need men in, in the church anymore because the women can take over. Uh, yet we look at Paul who talks to Timothy and to Titus and he recognizes through God's way of putting the family and the church together the Father is necessary. The man is necessary in the church. And when men vacate that responsibility, God will use women, but my belief is God ordained men to have certain roles in the church and in the family. And I think we need to stand strong for that because you have socialism and Marxism and feminist groups and Hollywood all focusing their attacks on men and making it necessary to say, we don't need men anymore. We don't need them. We don't even need them to start a family. They can just do things another way, so you don't really need a man at all involved. So we need to watch, especially for the church. Uh, I was thinking about that a little bit this morning. We need to realize, and that's why I wanted to recognize the, the elders and, of our church that we need strong men in the church, just like we need strong women to be in there. Men need to take their place as well. So let's keep our fathers in prayer. I wanted to do a little bit of a focus more on glorifying our Heavenly Father this morning. So if you turn with me to John, the 20th chapter. And verse 17, going back onto the fathers, uh, we need to pray for our fathers. We need to realize, men, that we need to stand up 
and recognize what is our godly, divine set of authority in the home. We have a father and we have the mother. And I believe when a, a, a husband and a wife are equally yoked together through God in a marriage, there's going to be the natural occurrence for the father to take the place he's supposed to. That doesn't mean he is lording it over his wife and says, well, I'm really in charge. Uh, I ought to be the one who has the final say. When a father is loving and caring the way God has ordained that to be, there's never going to be a problem who's the head of the house. In fact, if you look at it uh, from the logistic point, God is the head of the house. And when we discard God, of course, we're going to discard fatherhood. And that's exactly what's taking place. The more we see our country with, with the lack of God in, in the families, the father also falls too. So let's go to John 20, verse 17. What I like about this idea is we need to recognize God loves us and he wants to be our father. He does. If there's a cry that goes out from his heart is, I want to be your dad. I remember how Jesus said, Abba, Father. A very intimate term to say, you're my father. And I think if we understand that fathers, if we can understand how God loves us, that's going to help us to love our children the way God wants us to. So John 20, verse 17, Jesus is, of course, speaking to Mary Magdalene. He says, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God and to me. That is packed with the idea that Jesus is bringing all of us on his level. Because when he says to my Father and to your Father, he says, you're equal with me. We all have the same Father. We all have the same God. I like where it talks about uh, Jesus' prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. He's including us on the idea that we have a father and we have a right to claim him. We are not uh, illegitimate children in that sense that we don't have a father. We do. The problem is we allow our enemy to tell us what kind of a relationship we have with our father. He is he's ours. He's mine. Just like Jesus is my savior, God is my Heavenly Father. I have the right to claim both. Why? Because Jesus on the cross signed the adoption papers. I have a Heavenly Father. Uh, there's a few scriptures I wanted to look to to also discuss this. And then I would like to open up the microphone this morning for those of you who would like to pay a, a compliment or, or a story of something about a father, uh, please go ahead and do At the same time, I also recognize we as fathers make mistakes. We do. We are, gonna, we are human. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have our kids come and remind us of those every once in a while. But what we need to recognize is fathers are not perfect, but they are ordained by God. Uh, fathers, we need to love our kids. We need to show them that we have emotions too. I think that was a wrong thing brought out by Hollywood. Real men don't cry. Well, Jesus cried. I don't see a problem with that. If he cried for friends, if he cried for situations, we can too. Let's go to Malachi 2. We're going to go through some scriptures. If you've got your bulletin, you've got that on the back there. We're going to look at a few scriptures this morning. Uh, I want to glorify God. As my father, I don't want to just recognize him when Jesus comes. Oh, well, God is my father all along. It isn't. He's my father now. Malachi 2 and verse 10. And, and I'm hoping that these scriptures, brethren, are going to strengthen your faith that we have a right through the blood of Jesus Christ to go boldly into the throne of God and not only recognize him as the almighty that he is, but he's our dad. I can come to him with hurts and he wants to listen. Not only that, he wants to bring healing. You, you know, if one of my kids, when they were like three or four or five years old, and there would be a bully down the street who was nine or 10 or 12, twice the size of them, and start beating them, 
You don't think dad's going to come? Well, I'm going to put it into this right now. It's the same with us. When the devil goes after us and hurts us, or people do, don't we have the right to call in our father and he's coming? I believe he is. He protects his children. We have that promise. That's why Jesus says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He goes through the list of things that we can thank God for, that we are his children. Now Malachi 2 verse 10 says, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? So in saying simply, if we have one God and one Father, then we're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And if that's the case, we should not treat each other any less than the respect that they deserve. So I like the idea where Malachi says, we all have one Father. And I think we need to claim Him as our Father. Abba Father. I like the idea. Let's go to Matthew 23, verse 9. Matthew 23 and verse 9. Well, actually, let's go back one. Let's go to start with verse 8. Be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all of you are brethren. So he's bringing us back onto this level. We're all brethren with Jesus. And then verse 9, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Jesus, if he's making this statement, he knows. We can trust Jesus for what he says. When God wants us to call him father, that ought to tell us something, brethren. He's not this uh, old, beer-hated, gray man who's got this stick who's ready to go beat up on people. He is a God who loves and cares for us. And the greatest joy that he has is still in front of him. And you know what that is? To be reunited with his children again. Now it is f through faith and salvation, yes, but he's wanting us back with him. We need to understand that's who our God is. Let's go to John 1, verse 12. John 1, verse 12. Brethren, I think that's something we need to do. We need to accept the truth that He is our Father and loves and cares for us. He's not this distant, deist God that you can't get a hold of. He's there for us. He loves and cares for us. I feel sorry for people who, who do not have that relationship with God. John 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become, what does it say? The sons, the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. That's how we get it. Now don't we have in another place, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear we shall, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Brethren, we've been adopted. He is my Father, which means I have the right to claim His protection, His blessings, His love and care for my life. I have that right because He's my Father. Remember how it says in another place that if, if a man does not care and take care of his family, he is worse than a what? Why? Because He's comparing that to God, our Heavenly Father, who does do all these things. And God expects us as the underfathers, if I can call us that, to do the same for our families. If God protects and looks after us, so should we. Sometimes we have to sacrifice. I want my father. I want him for the way he wants his relationship with me. I don't want the world and I don't want our enemy to tell me how close I can get to my father in heaven. Let's go to Galatians 3.26. He loves and cares for us, and I think the greatest problem we have right now is we don't allow our God to be as close as He wants to be in our hearts and lives. Galatians 3.26 For you are all the children of who? By faith in Christ Jesus. That tells me I need something to, to accept that, to claim it, is it comes through Jesus Christ. Because we're never going to be able to accept God as our Father until we have that faith and that understanding that comes through Jesus Christ. We're not. And I thank Him. And you know what? Fathers make mistakes. We're not perfect. And we can uh, 
knowingly or unknowingly cause problems for our children, but we've got a father who never does that. Never does that. Let's go to 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2. You know, I, I wanted to pull out these scriptures because the facts are there, brethren. The facts are there. He is my father. He loves me. He asked his son to die for us so he could reclaim us as his children. I believe when it went through the genealogy, going through Matthew, and Adam, who was the son of who? Was, is Abraham considered a son of God? Are we all children through Abraham? I think we need to come and start grabbing those, those promises and saying, those are mine. We, had, uh, we have blue shirts at home. It says adopted. And we wore that in Austin, Texas one time, went to this big Lego thing. I mean, they had these huge figures of Batman and Star Wars and all this stuff like that. Well, you know what, with our kids, they were a lot younger than in those days. We decided we were going to be the first line, and we were the first in line. We got into Austin, boom, we parked, and we had the adopted on the back, and then it had a scripture on the side. We still got those shirts. And one lady came up to me and said, I like what your shirt says. We are adopted as his children. Don't allow the devil to tell us anything less than that. He's my dad, if I can call him my heavenly father. And he loves his children. I like that song. God leads his dear children along. Why? Because he loves us. What's God's goal? You know, can we understand for a moment that God's heart breaks every day for his children? Every one of those children who die on this earth without him, doesn't his heart break? He cares. 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that what? We should be called the sons and daughters of God. What is that? That's the truth. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See that? We now are the sons, not later on. Now we are. Which means I have the right to claim royalty. If Christ is king, and I'm his younger brother, I am a royal son of God. We need to be able to get that, brethren, and wrap that around it and start living in that truth instead of, well, I'll get by with my cheese and crackers again this week. We are now children of royalty. I'm glad someone said amen to that. <laughs> That's one of the lies too many times we grab onto. I'm not good enough to be. I'm not, I've done too many. No, 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 no. Jesus knew that all along before we were born. He died for us on that cross because he knew every sin. There wasn't, okay, uh, I'm going to die for that person until he comes to me. And afterwards, we're not going to really know what's going to happen with all these sins. He died for all. Look at it. God saw all that we were going to do. And he still told his son, go and die for them. <clears throat> Knowing what we were going to do. Doesn't the Bible say, while we were yet enemies? We weren't looking for him, but he was looking for us. There's a beautiful song that talks about how Jesus is a shepherd, and he goes out in the night searching for the lost sheep. Why does he do that? Because the Father told him to. Go find my sheep. We're going to close with 1 John 4, and then I would like to open up the mic for those of you who would like to, to make an expression of thanks or a memory, what you would like to go through there. 1 John 4, verses 16 and 17. Brethren, it gives me joy to recognize my Father. He's mine and yours. He loves us all the same. There are no favorites with God. Oh, if I could only earn His attention or His love. You don't have to. 
He already gave it to us. We just have to come by faith and say, I am accepting that grace that you gave to us. So 1 John 4, 16 and 17, And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. Do you know there are many people that call themselves Christians who can't get past that stage? That God really loves them? That God really cares? God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. We get the idea? How can we have a relationship with a God if all we have is a fear of him? Love has to be the overriding principle that we're going on with this. Verse 17, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So when we come on judgment day, if we had to go appear before the judgment seat, and we're appearing before the judge, all we have to say is, God is my Father and Jesus is my Savior. He sent his son to die for me, and God loves me, and I believe it. That's all I need. I don't have to prove anything else. I don't have to bring anything else to the table. Because, you know, when our, first, when our kids came out as little babies, they didn't have to earn our love, did they? We loved them naturally. You want to give them a hug, but they're all purple at the time, so you can't do that. But afterwards, as soon as you can, you give them a, a kiss on the, on the forehead. You love them so much. Isn't that telling us how God feels about us? Awesome. We need to, brethren, open up our hearts and say, God, please allow me to know how much you love me. I think that's one of the greatest revelations we as the church need to know. Because when we know that, that revolutionizes my self-esteem, and my hope and what I can do through God. Father in heaven, you are a great and awesome God. How could you love us is a question that may go unanswered for many of us, but Lord, we do know that you do love us. And we thank you for that everlasting love that you have for us, that you care for us as your children, that you want us home with you. So Lord, help us to get there. Help us to believe and to trust and not to doubt and lose out. Help us to know that you love and care for your children. When we make mistakes, help us to realize you're there to pick us up because you love and care for us. When we don't understand the way things are going in our lives, come and visit us with your love and care. We may not understand, but we're going to know that our God is there. We ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.